Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 24 on a series we're doing on heaven. We've been using this book by Randy Alcorn, titled Heaven, uh, as a guide for our study. If you have not seen the first 23 episodes, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will take the time to go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, each episode's two hours long, so it's hard to believe, but we've already talked about heaven for 46 hours. And uh, I do want to tell you, Brother Eric, we're going to be finishing this up here. I, I'm planning on uh, today and next Sunday. These will be the final two episodes, as according to the way I see it. So. Altogether, we'll probably have about 50 hours of discussion on heaven, and it's been a, a wonderful topic to study because it just gives us such joy and happiness and, and hope for our future. Um, before we get started, Brother Eric, why don't you say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, everybody who's been watching knows me, uh, Jesus Knight 72. Um, I definitely think you should take uh, Luke's advice here. Go back, check out the. Um, uh, the different episodes in your own time and you know, take your time with them. I think there's a lot to be learned in them. Um, if you just take it at face value for you know how long it's taking to get through this whole thing um, and not really look into the the meat of what's being said, I think I think you're missing a whole lot. I think you there's a lot to be learned and there's um, a lot of um, a lot of joy to be gained from the discussion. And I think you're really selling yourself short if you don't check out the the videos. You know, even for your own personal to to run your opinions by what we think. Um, maybe it's a comfort to you, um, but uh, it's definitely worth looking back on. Um, they're there as long as they're going to be there for a long time, so it's something you can take your time with and check out here and there, skim through, you know, go through the questions you think are more pertinent to what you think. But you know, I, I want to just finish up by saying I think in this day and age, with everything that's going on, um, it's so nice to get into that discussion, which I believe, and I know Luke believes, you know, the times we're living in right now, we are so close to our heavenly home that, uh, you know, I, I, think, um, I think it should really give you a lot to look forward to, and, uh, and hopefully the series will do that for people. Yes, amen. So, uh, Brother Eric, thank you for joining me again today. Uh, we're going to pick up now in Randy Alcorn's book, uh, Chapter 35. And one of the things that we enjoy about Randy's book here is that uh, uh, each chapter uh, is titled as a question. And then throughout the chapter are multiple follow-up questions. Uh, so he poses a question and then he gives an answer uh, based upon what he thinks the scripture says or how he speculates. And, and then we're going to uh, see if we agree or not or and give our opinions. So his chapter 35 title is, Will There Be Marriage, Families, and Friendships? Uh, well, before I read, start reading it, what's your first reaction to that? I mean, I think, I'm, I'm thinking this chapter here will be one of the most interesting th chapters to study as far as a lot of people wonder about this. That's, it's, a very, it's a very good question. Um, I, know, I know it's one that people, uh, many people have varying different opinions about. Um, I would say to a degree, yes to all three of those questions. Um, will there be marriage? Yes. Our marriage as the church to our husband, the Lord. Uh, so there's one marriage right there that will take place. Um, families? Yes. We'll all be one family. Uh, one big family. So of course there will be families. Um, and But I understand the basis behind the question. Yeah, I do believe, I believe we'll see others as who we knew them to be, whether we knew them to be our wife, our son, our daughter, our, our husband, or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I believe we'll remember them in such a context. And um, friendships, in my opinion, you can't have a, a true family and true love without friendships. You know, friendship is all, is all tied to that, you know. So I'd say, in, in a way, yes to all the questions. Well, brother, I want to tell you that you answered that question so well that we can just skip this chapter now and move on. <laughs> I'd like to have some biblical support. My it's probably better that we look into it a little bit. But. No, that was very good. I, I think we'll, we'll discover everything you said uh, is correct as we go through this uh, chapter here. 
Uh, so Randy Alcorn writes, uh, receiving a glorified body and relocating to the new earth doesn't erase history. It culminates history. Nothing will negate or minimize the fact that we were members of families on the old earth. My daughters will always be my daughters, although first and foremost they are and will be God's daughters. My grandchildren will always be my grandchildren. Resurrection bodies presumably have chromosomes and DNA with a signature that forever testifies to our genetic connection with our family. Um, Heaven won't be without families, but will be one big family in which all family members are friends and all friends are family members. We'll have family relationships with people who were our blood family on earth, but we'll also have family relationships with our friends, both old and new. We can't take material things with us when we die, but we do take our friendships to heaven, and one day they'll be renewed. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's uh, you could have written that uh, those first opening paragraphs there. It's pretty you're right in, in agreement with uh, Randy Alcorn's viewpoint on that. Uh, I think that uh, pretty well clarifies that point here. I'm going to move on to this next question he asked here. Uh, will there be marriage and family? Uh, he says one group of religious leaders, the Sadducees, tried to trick Jesus with a question about marriage in heaven. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Attempting to make him look foolish, they told Jesus of a woman who had seven husbands who all died. They asked him, Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Christ replied, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor will be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 22. Um, well, before I go on with what Randy says, what's your reaction to that, uh, to the, the verses uh, where the Sadducees posed this question and Jesus answered it? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because the thing I think when I read that part, I was smiling when you were reading it because I, right away I remembered the part in the scripture. And I always wondered to myself, um, did the Sadducees respect, uh, uh, expect an answer? Were, were they kind of taken back by the answer? Were they kind of, did it anger them or did it intrigue them <laughs> that he actually came up with an answer maybe an answer that they weren't contemplating um, I, I think look it, let's not keep it simple you know the philosophy of keeping it simple I think is always a, a great philosophy and Christ answers the question we won't be bound by matrimony as we knew each other to be bound by matrimony on earth it won't be like that anymore it's gonna be like um, we're gonna be like the angels we'll remember those relationships but we won't be bound by those relationships as we were on Earth. Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, let's let's. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about your comments there as, as we get Mitch. Brother Mitch. Hi. We're, can you hear us now? I don't know. Well, he's, he's smiling, so we can tell he's very happy. He's getting have things to set set the whole thing up. It's there. It's, you it's, go. It's a real pain. I can't hear anything. <laughs> I, you know. It's all right. Take your time. Take your time. Make sure. Right. Make sure. Uh, we'll. I'll, I'll discuss this with Eric while you're getting yourself set up there. Uh, um, the uh, what you said, I was really surprised because I've never heard anybody say put it that way. That asking. I wonder if the Sadducees were surprised that Jesus even answered the question. Were they really expecting an answer, or they thought, "Look, we'll show him. We'll put him in right. school. He <laughs> exactly. won't really answer this question." Uh, and yet, he did have an answer. Uh, so that was very interesting. I've never even considered that possibility. Uh, but then, what about the answer, though? The uh, the idea that uh, we're not going to be married. But but we will be like the angels, he says, mm -hmm. who do not marry. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does it mean to be like the angels? I and mean, a lot of people take that to and read a lot into it. I think people put too much emphasis on sex. Yes. Well, well yeah, I think, I think yeah, I think I I think Mitch nailed it. I I think that was pro that was probably the biggest concern that was going through their heads when they were when they were thinking of the question, and. 
you know, it, it's this thing. It's like sex is not going to be in, to me. I don't know if the book's going to cover this. To me, it's not going to be an issue anymore in heaven. It's not going to be. That's not the nature of our relationships anymore. So it really doesn't matter. It doesn't apply to, to at all. The question doesn't even apply because the relationships aren't like that. We're gonna. Um, work together as a family, as a you know, as friends and family, as he discussed in the beginning of the chapter, and it's going to be in a capacity where we're individuals and yet all part of the family of the body of Christ. You know, working together uh, for the same goals, you know, as the angels do. Um, it's going to be a very close, a very close family, uh, family union. It's not going to be something where. You know, for for the purpose of procreation on the earth, we get married to a spouse and we have a marriage and things like that. It won't really apply because that's not the kind of that's not the relationship we're going to have. Mm -hmm. Well, when Jesus uh, said that, uh, uh, let me see, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Um, I know that people use this to show that uh, we're not going to get married because angels don't get married. Uh, but I've had some, uh, you know, Dr. Peter Ruck, but I've mentioned him numerous times in my videos. I've read many of his books, and he posed something that I thought was really interesting. I don't agree with this, but he says that we're going to be like the angels in heaven. Of course, we, we all know that angels do not intermarry with each other, but we also know that every angel in Scripture is described as a male. Right. I, are, I was just going to say that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. There are no female no. Um, uh, angels in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, so male uh, angels either have uh, described in a male way, or they manifest themselves with male bodies, never female bodies, uh, uh, or they uh, uh, maybe they do have some male um, uh, you know gender to them or not. But but we we they're always described as being male. And if that's the case, the only way that they could be married is if you had men marrying men, if angels were mar being married to each other. So we, we think that, no, angels are all male. There's no indication they do get married. Uh, but Dr. Ruckman takes it a step further. He says we're going to be like the angels, and that means that everybody is going to be male. So your wife will be turned into a man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that opinion. No, I don't agree with that opinion. I, I think the answer is much more simple than that. And I think, look, man and this isn't complicated, really. It's not really complicated. Men and men and women were created for the purpose of procreation. It was the whole point. Angels don't procreate. They don't do that. Um, they don't have. There's no need for that in the nature of their existence. They don't do it. So. In that way, that's as simple as, as it gets. Whether we're whether we're physically looking like males or physically looking like females, um, the purpose of procreation is no longer necessary for the believers in that in that uh, uh, environment. It's not necessary for us to do that anymore. So um, I, I think people are being a little too complicated with it. They're trying to make it a little more complicated. Will we all look like males? I mean, I, I no, I would say no because there are actual verses in Scripture. That, um, well, for instance, anytime people saw the visions in heaven, whether it was, well, we'll take John from Revelation, and he sees um, uh, nations and tribes and tongues, and he sees all these people. He says people. He doesn't say men. He doesn't say, I just see men. He, sa he says he sees people, implying he sees men, women, you know, he sees all, you know, all different people from races and, and types and everything. So, uh, no, I don't agree with that uh, opinion. Well, our, in, in eternity, our wives and daughters will remain female, uh, and, and uh, if they were changed into male, they would no longer be themselves, and so it wouldn't be them who want, who got eternal life in heaven they, because they changed into somebody else, a male. Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's another side, too, and maybe I'm looking at this a little too simplistically, but, you know, the... Um, as a male, uh, the female is a very beautiful thing to look at, um, and God created that. And why would he take away great beauty that he created just because it seems to be unnecessary in heaven? I don't think he would do that. I think there's going to be great beauty in heaven, and I think uh, the, the uh, women in heaven will be, great, will be very beautiful <laughs> and so because I think that's the way God made them. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that uh, Mitch has, is all set up and ready to talk now, so let me Hi. ask you if you're ready. Mitch, uh, this is Mitchell Belenkoff. Introduce yourself, and then... Hi. Uh, 
<laughs> Mitch has two channels on YouTube, Mitchell Bolankoff and also another channel titled James Bondage. So I hope you'll subscribe to his channels. Uh, so the question, uh, Brother Mitch, is simply when Jesus answered the Sadducees, uh, do you think that's evidence then that there's not going to be um, marriage? We no longer be married to our spouses in heaven the way that we are now. Well, I, I look at it like we're little children. You know, when when I was a kid, I didn't have any thoughts of of being married or whatnot. I just lived my life. I had a good time. You know, it wasn't that wasn't even a thought in my head. So, the people I know, if my if my wife grew a mustache, you know, it wouldn't, in heaven, you know, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't picture my wife with a beard and a mustache in heaven. She's going to be who she is in heaven, and I'm going to be whoever I am in heaven, and whoever, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't see us, uh, us uh, transforming into something that's transgender. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe we won't have any gender parts. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But I just don't see us, not, you know, I see us being fully developed as, as, as human beings, but not Mm -hmm. um, in, 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 you know, not procreating and not having any desire to do so. But the, the beauty of a woman, the, the glory of a woman is the glory of a woman, the glory of a man is the glory of a man. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go to heaven where we have all sorts of, like, like what, unisex. It's, it, it's <laughs> not going to happen. So, I don't so think it's going to be like that. Uh, do, do all of us agree, then, that this uh, statement by Jesus was serves as a proof text that uh, we are we will no longer have our marriage relationship. We'll, I assume that we're going to maybe even living with our spouses and and, and or uh, maybe they have the condo next door to mine. My wife will or something, but we will not be having this um, considered it to be a marriage the way that we do now because the only, the only marriage that will exist in uh, eternity, eternal heaven is the uh, uh, the marriage between Christ and the church. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's another thing to consider too, and that's the fact that you know um, nothing happens without God's knowledge in our lives. Um, I think there are there's more to our relationships with who we know than we even understand. And I think that's going to come to light a little bit more when we are in heaven and then on uh, in the new uh, on the new earth and in eternity. I think we're going to understand it a little bit more. Um, I think the relationships we have with other people are not coincidental. I think they are. Those relationships are there for a reason. Okay. So then Randy writes, um, earthly marriage. Um, I'm not, here on earth, we long for a perfect marriage. That's exactly what we'll have, a perfect marriage with Christ. Randy says, my wife Nancy is my best friend and my closest sister in Christ. Will we become more distant in the new world? Of course not. We'll become closer, I'm convinced. The God who said it is not good for the man to be alone in Genesis 2 is the giver and blesser of our relationships. Life on this earth matters. What we do here touches strings that reverberate for all eternity. Nothing will take away from the fact that Nancy and I are marriage partners here and that we invest so much in our lives in each other, serving Christ together. I fully expect no one besides God will understand me better on the new earth, and there's nobody whose company I'll seek and enjoy more than Nancy's. So, it, yeah, it, it seems like Randy, Randy and I agree on, on that, yeah, that... Uh, we won't have the marriage relationship as we understand it, in, you know, in this time. Uh, but I don't think that we're going to become uh, like my wife is not going to be some distant person because I'll be off what, uh, making all these other friendships in, in heaven and I forget about my wife. I, I'm, I, I'm I'll still love her and still want to be uh, spend a lot of time with her. Imagine. I think that that it goes beyond that. I look at at Rachel weeping for her children, and I really think that that it goes. There, um, some connection, um, you know. You're gonna you're gonna probably party with your grandchildren and your great grandfather. You're gonna meet people that you might not have never known before because that's all part of your family. Mm hmm. Hmm. I think I'll find that very interesting. Even though I've never done any really investigating into my you know genealogies. Uh, uh, 
I don't know if you guys have ever looked into yours, but uh, I've never really taken any time to study that and see see who my ancestors are. But I think uh, it would be very interesting to to meet them in, in eternity. Uh, Jesus said the institution of human marriage would end, having fulfilled its purpose, but he never hinted that deep relationships between married people would end. Okay. Um, uh, and then he says, what about our children? What about relationships to my... Uh, to my daughters and son-in-laws and closest friends. There's every reason to believe we'll pick right up in heaven with, with relationships from the earth. We'll gain many new ones, but we'll continue to deepen the old ones. Hmm. I think that's an important point right there. I'd like to stop there because, you know, there are a lot of people who go through this life and they lose children at a very young age that they've only managed to spend one, two, five, ten years with a child, and one of the things they hold most dear is the idea that they'll be able to spend more time with that child that they miss now uh, once they go into heaven into eternity. I think I think by saying you wouldn't have that would really take away from one of the great joys that parents ha uh, have waiting for their uh, children that they want to see again and for children who have lost their parents early. Um, I, I think that really, you know, we I've said this before, but We've spent the worst of our lives here on earth in sin. You know, we definitely want to, with the people we know and love, spend the best of our lives in eternity and share that with them. I think, again, the sharing, that's all part of, of that looking forward to. Yes, and I think you, uh, you briefly mentioned that maybe the missed opportunities in life where maybe you had a loved one that uh, – uh, died at a young age, and they never had a chance to grow up. And you have that relationship; with, you'll you'll have that chance with them then. Or or maybe maybe uh, you had a relationship with with someone, but it wasn't as as good as you wanted it to be. Well, you'll be able to. It'll be uh, hey, have your chance there with all of the problems you had with them in the past. That's all forgotten and forgiven, and and you just you can just embrace and love each other, even though uh, in this life uh, maybe there were strife and problems between you. Yeah, maybe enemies will actually be friends up there. Yeah. yeah, I agree, Mitch. I think that's going to be some of the greatest victories in heaven is is to be able to go to those people that you may have had falling outs with, and patch those relationships and and feel that love of being you know, brothers and sisters again in in heaven. That that's going to be, I think, an amazing thing. Yeah, I really, I would really look forward to that because. Uh, um, there's a there's a lot of people I've encountered here. I don't want to say a lot, but there's there's a handful of people I've encountered in my YouTube experience that uh, you know seem to hate me, really seem to be dislike me for some various reasons. And uh, I think that you know they'll basically just like forgive and forget whatever differences they had with me, they'll, and they'll and they'll love me. And I look forward to that because uh, uh, even though. Uh, we we have our problems now. Uh, I don't hate them, and I don't want to like uh, you know um, um, have animosity with them. But I know all of that will be healed. So that that'll be wonderful. Uh, now the next question he asks is, will there be sex? He says, as we saw earlier, we'll maintain distinct genders in our resurrection bodies. We'll be male or female, but will there be sex in the sense of sexual relations? If human marriage existed on the new earth, uh, by all means, I would expect it to include sex. Sexual relations existed before the fall and were not the product of sin and the curse. They were God's perfect design. Since the lifting of the curse will normally restore what God originally made, we would expect sex to be part of that. Given what we know about continuity between this life and the next, marriage and sex seem natural carryovers. He's got more to say on that, but before I go on, uh, the, one thing stands out as a mistake that he made it there. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think he's wrong. But uh, what, what, what do you say about that? <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it's it's laughable to me. It really is because it, so so many people, like I said before, are focused on sex. They really think that somehow or another, or we, that that we need it up there. And well, Adam and Eve were put on the earth, and they were yeah, they were definitely given sex, but that was because Eve was the mother of the living, and there was there was there was you know there was a seed, and and I did a whole series on seeds, and there was a seed that came with a woman, and the seed that came from Satan, 
and one seed trampled on the other seed. The other the seed uh, struck the, the heel of the other one. But after that, it's all over. There's no more procreation. And then, and then there's the thing is, well, if we're, not, if we're not making babies, then what are we doing? There's no more babies being made up there. Are there? Are, are, we, are, are we having more children in heaven? Are they, they being born? Is this, is this what we're saying? We're making a, a new, you know, more people? I, I don't think so. I think all the people that are there are going to be there. I don't know that we're going to be making more people. Yeah, I I want to I want to engage something that Mitch said. I think I think something he said is like um it, it's great because it really is you can you can really focus in and see a big problem we have as human beings. The one caveat I would say for the sex, of course, is clearly in the millennium there's going to be sex because the people who are on the earth during the millennium in thousand years are going to be more generations of being born. So there will clearly be procreation in the millennium. As far as our relationship being resurrected. And uh, being in our roles, you know, before moving into eternity, obviously the caveat being the people in the millennium. I think this is very telling about in the world today the focus people have, the wrong focus they have on the nature of the relationships, which is a lot of the problems we have relationships as human beings. A lot of people establish their relationships based on sex, and they don't establish relationships based on what God wants you to establish a relationship on. Yes, sex comes with that. It comes with a marriage relationship, but that's not why you establish relationships with other people. And unfortunately, in our world today, in our society, that's one of the biggest reasons people establish relationships with each other, and it's a big mistake. Um, it's why, for instance, you know, you, you ask most secular people, their idea about marriage is, or you should definitely be sleeping with people before you get married, because you should, you got to know this about them and that about them, and it totally destroys the purpose behind that God has for marriage. Um, and you know what Mitch said, I think is is perfect. It's because because of that, our focus. Notice how it shifts to that. It becomes such a big part of our lives that oh, are we gonna have sex in heaven? Are, we're gonna not have sex. That's gonna be a big problem. It's like why is it gonna be a big problem? That that's that shouldn't be your focus, your main focus anyway. That's not why you have relationships with other people. You know that's not why you have marriages. That's not the reason you have marriage. It's just so you can have sex. I mean, you get married because. You know, it's about making a covenant with God that's very special, sharing your life with another person, the good, the bad. Uh, people don't forget that in their marriage vows these days, the good and the bad. You know, the bad comes with that. It's about sacrifice. It's about giving of yourself. It's not about sex. But in our society, everything's directed towards sex. And I think what Mitch said spelled it out perfectly. That's the nature of the problem and why our focus is so bad. Well, worse, worse than that. Um, just this whole thing is twisted. So people up in heaven are not going to be homosexual. Everyone will be homosexual, and everybody will be sleeping around in heaven. Does that does that sound perverted? I mean, that sounds like <laughs> well, nuts. Uh, let's let's go back to uh, the beginning and uh, what would what was the purpose of sex and and what was the purpose of giving us this sexual desire? Um, it was for reproduction. Uh, it was to populate the earth, uh, and, and it was to be done within a marriage. But but within a marriage, uh, God gave man and and male and female this uh, drive, drive, the sex drive, this craving, and this urge, and, and that caused them to want to come together. And because it was pleasurable, they wanted, they enjoyed it, wanted to do it, and that created offspring. And the earth got populated. Uh, so that was the real purpose of it, and. Uh, the fact that it's enjoyable uh, is some really it's it was wonderful to enjoy within a marriage, but the reason it was enjoy made to be enjoyable, I think, is because if you enjoy it, you'll want to do it and want to reproduce, and therefore you're going to have offspring. So that whole really goes back to the point of multiply and replenish the earth. But here's the thing that I want to ask you about in his, in his paragraph. He says, sexual relations existed before the fall and were not the product of sin and the curse. They were God's perfect design. Uh, do you think that's a true statement? Design for what? What was the purpose of the design? Well, I'm, I'm talking about the first part of his statement. Sexual relations existed before the fall. Right, but, but, but for well, a yes. reason. <laughs> yes, and because, because before the fall happened, God God tells the man, and the woman, to be fruitful and multiply. You know, so so clearly that relationship was meant to be there, and and it's also talked about where it it's told in childbirth, whether when they do birth their children after the fall, 
it would be through pain. There was going to be a lot of pain involved in doing that. So this was something they were aware of, something they were aware of that relationship. So yeah, I'd say yeah, that is accurate. So you think that is a true statement, and I think you you're you're uh, using this point that uh, uh, he told them to be fruitful and multiply before the fall. Therefore, they must have had sex before the fall. I guess you could uh, come to that conclusion. But I've always thought, and I've never really tried to study this to figure out what is the right answer, but. I always thought there was no sexual relationship with Adam and Eve until until after the fall. Uh, but I don't know where I got that idea from. But I just that's what I thought. Well, I think you got the I think you got the idea from the fact that Scripture doesn't mention any children being born to them until after the fall. So, so it does seem that um, I, I guess there I guess there is a a possibility there that that maybe that was meant for their their purpose in procreating after the fall. Um, I don't know. It's that's an interesting that's an interesting point you made. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get back to Randy because uh, that first paragraph on sex that he wrote there gives the impression that he's uh, uh, saying that we will be sexually active in eternal heaven, and then he goes on to say, however, as we've seen, Christ made it clear that people in heaven wouldn't be married to each other. He wasn't talking about talking merely about the intermediate heaven, but in the resurrection. He was specifically saying there will be no marriage among resurrected people on the resurrected earth. Because sex was designed to be part of a marriage relationship, marriage and sex logically belong together. Because we're told that humans won't be married to each other and sex is intended for marriage, then logically we won't be engaging in sex. So at first you think Randy's making the case that we're going to be sexually active in eternity, and then, but then he says, however. Right. So I think that the, the however perspective is the correct perspective on that. I think we all agree on that. Um, so uh, the without turning this into some kind of like uh, you know uh, no children should be watching show you know uh, what do they call it uh, you know PG adult only PG or uh, adults only show um, you know. The, the sexual activity uh, is, is a very powerful drive in, in mankind. And I know that uh, I'm 63 now, and I know that my interest in sex and drive for sex is greatly, greatly diminished from what it was when I was a young man. And that drive almost ruined my life because of taking control of my life and being obsessed with it. And I know this is true for many men, that it, it, it's an overwhelming drive. Uh, and the 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 pleasure gained from a sexual act uh, is the word is called orgas orgasm, which is orgasmic. It's an ecstatic feeling. Well, so we we love that, and we we like to think, well, that would be wonderful to have that continue in eternity to have this sexual uh, pleasure, an orgasmic pleasure. Uh, but I said, you know, many episodes ago, I I felt that. Uh, just existing in God's presence would be this ec ecstatic feeling greater than any feeling of pleasure we've ever experienced. And it's not going to be for a moment, it's going to be a, an ongoing just feeling of ecstasy and bliss and joy. Like I said, people put too much emphasis on sex. Yeah. They, it's just, it's just, you know, they, don't, they don't think that pleasure in life is anything different. I mean, no, and, and look, at the, look at the world, the world, the world pushes it. <laughs> It drives our culture. It, it Mitch, drives our culture these days. Mitch, why were you looking at me when you said that statement? <laughs> I wasn't you know, looking at you know, <laughs> it. I think um I think people have a big problem disassociating the drives they have now from what their drive is going to be in heaven. They, they they won't associate how they feel about things now that they're going to feel the same way about all those things in heaven, and you won't. Your drive is going to be clearly different. You're going to focus. Otherwise, sins that you inwardly wrestle with that you like to you know think about, you know, you would have those as well. So that drive is not going to be there. Not that sex is a sin. And I know people make the argument. I think I think the word in here, marriage, is the key. And Jesus really – and this is another one of those instances where Jesus answers with a very short sentence, going back to what he said to the Sadducees. He answers with a very short sentence, but there's so much to be learned about in that sentence. 
And when, when he mentions it's a marriage question, and marriage is the key, why was sex made? Sex was, was – did God – people argue and say, well, sex was made by God for us to enjoy. Yes, it was to make us want to procreate. It was something that you – know, it made us want to do that and share that relationship. Um, but, but in a marriage setting, and if we are no longer married in heaven, there won't be a reason for that sort of relationship. It's, I think that right there, the marriage is the key, and you take that away, like Mitch said. Unfortunately, our culture is driven by sex, yes. and you take sex away, and we almost have nothing to talk about anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that if we – if we will just focus on the many promises that we have of uh, joy and bliss and happiness uh, forever in, it, in our eternal heaven, then obviously if a person was desiring uh, sex and they weren't getting it, they're not going to be very happy. Obviously, there, the other things are going to have much greater interest and there will be no interest in, in sex because, uh, because uh, that desire is removed and there's... Uh, other things that are far more satisfying and appealing, but the question here is: This Randy's pretty daring with this next question. He goes because he, he really next he says, "Okay, if we're not going to have sexual activity, then will we actually retain our sex organs?" Well, I don't want to be singing the soprano in heaven. <laughs> No, it's be some and, and and really, and that's why I waited to answer because I knew Mitch was going to say something that was just going to you know kick this thing off, and so I just wanted to wait for it. Um, but I mean, I, <laughs> I don't, um, I don't know. It's it's a good question, really. I mean, do you have any need for it? No. <laughs> um, does it make you uniquely you? I mean, I guess kind of in a way, but. I don't know. It's a, it's a. I don't know. It's a very. It's a good question. I don't have an answer for that question. I. I don't know. I okay. Know. Let's see what Randy Alcorn's answer is. He says, uh, uh, "Will our resurrection bodies have sex organs? Since men will be men and women will be women, and since there will be direct continuity between the old bodies and the new, there's every reason to believe they will. Is that inconsistent?" since they wouldn't be fulfilling a function for which they were designed. Not necessarily. Jesus was a perfect man, yet he was single and abstained from sex. Unmarried people on earth have been called to celibacy, but they are still fully human. So, uh, I mean, he goes on to say more about it, but uh, I think that's the main point there, is that, uh, uh, you know, our bodies are... G Scripture says that our glorified bodies will be modeled after Jesus' glorified body. His is the prototype that we can expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, if Jesus was uh, perfectly resurrected man with the same body, but, you know, uh, eternal body uh, in the resurrection, then, uh, you know, we'll be resurrected with all of our body parts too, will remain our, our identity, our, our male identity I'll keep, and yet uh, Jesus, I'm, I'm guessing that Jesus had no desire for sex. Uh, and if he did, I mean, I know the Bible says he was tempted in all ways, but uh, being tempted doesn't mean that you, have, you felt temptation. It means, that, like, if, if a woman tempts me, Right. And this hap By the way, guys, this happens to me all the time. There's a lot of young, beautiful women that are yeah, always, I bet you. always pursuing me, always being, he's trying to seduce me. And I found that the best remedy is just to start telling them about Jesus. And all of a sudden, they're, no, they, they're not so excited about me anymore. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's, an, there's one other interesting take on that. And there is there an instance in the Bible where we're led to believe that there's something that a resurrection body doesn't have that it used to? And I think the question could be yes. Well, one is sin nature. Obviously, we won't have sin nature. That's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's yeah. inherently part of us as being a human being. It, we, we have it. We're born into this world with it. It's just something that's unavoidable. It's like a disease. We have it when we're born. Um, but 
when Jesus comes back, and and I'm not saying this is absolute fact. I'm saying I just happen to be a person who happens to believe that when he says something when he returns, there might be something a little telling about it. When Jesus says, you know, handle me, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see I have. He doesn't mention blood. Now, we know he had wounds, and his wounds were still open because Thomas said he wanted to put his, his hand into his side and into the hand. Into his, so he clearly had the wounds, and he showed them these wounds. But it, it, it doesn't mention one of the, you know, a term that we used often, flesh and blood. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says flesh and bone. It could insinuate that his body didn't have blood anymore. Um, now, maybe that's not the case. Maybe I'm looking too far into it. But it is a possibility, and I know I'm not the first person that ever came up with that. Um, I so, think it would look a little funny without blood, but you know, it might be raspberry juice or something. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, or, or, why, would, well, you know. Well, or would we, or would we just look paler than the normal, uh, or would that have no bearing on our coloration of our skin at all? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, it's just, it's just an interesting thing I thought I'd kind of throw out there. Yeah. Um, well, I know that uh, Dr. Ruckman has written about this too. He he takes your uh, side there that there will be no blood in the glorified bodies uh, because there's another verse that says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And but and yet f flesh and bone, uh, Jesus said his body was flesh and bone. To, right. to, so to reconcile those two verses, Dr. Ruckman and others say, well, we'll have flesh and bone, but we won't have blood. Right. So I, I, but rather than get into that, if that is the case, then, then our bodies will not be identical to the bodies we have now. They'll be, we know they're going to be different in some ways because they're going to have different kinds of uh, uh, abilities. They'll be eternal. They'll never be able to get sick and so on. Um, but uh, I, I think that it, it looks like we're going to have anatomically correct human male bodies and females will have their anatomically correct female bodies. Um, but I, I'm assuming that our our desire will will be disappear, just like our desire for sin and sinful things will disappear. Yeah. I'd say I'd say I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Now he has a comment by C.S. Lewis here. Let's see what C.S. Lewis says about sexual intercourse in heaven. He wrote, "I think our present outlook might be that of a small boy who, on being told that the sexual act was the highest bodily pleasure, should immediately ask." whether you ate chocolates at the same time. On receiving the answer no, he might regard absence of chocolates as the chief characteristic of sexuality. In vain would you tell him that the reason why lovers in their carnal raptures don't bother about chocolates is that they have something better to think of. The boy knows chocolate. He does not know the positive thing that excludes it. We are in the same position. We know the sexual life. We do not know, except in glimpses, the other thing which in heaven will leave no room for it. I don't know. To me, the whole thing, I never even thought about it. I never thought, I never even, I, I, it just, to me, it's just, I would be in heaven just like I was a little child. When I was a kid, I didn't have, I had fun. I had fun with with friends. I had I had I had people, neighbors, friends that I hung out with. My family hung uh, hung around together. Everybody was, you know, it was never mentioned because I was from that World War II after World War II era where people didn't talk about stuff like that. Maybe Victorian, yeah. but but it just seemed to me like it was there was, there was just a, a world without it that was so much better. Yeah. And, and as far as my body is concerned, I never considered myself to be any different than what I am except for that I'm sinless up there and that I don't have all these problems that I had when I grew up anyway. That, that yeah. all those things that, 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 you know, when you hit puberty, all of a sudden the, the, everything went down the toilet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know I think so, that's uh, accurate. No, I think you're, I think that's an accurate statement. It's just true. Yeah. So, so, so I'd rather be pre prepubescent than, 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 than be post uh, yeah right I can really talk but, but you know what I'm talking about no I think, I, think, I think Mitch's point there is well taken I think it's exactly what you were saying Luke and ultimately it's the same thing you, when, when you were that age you know, pre-puberty you didn't care you didn't, it didn't mean anything to you you had so many other things you were into and enjoyed and I, I think Mitch is, is correct I, I, I think that that's, that's a great way of picturing that it's like before sex came along and your realization of sex, 
Yeah, um, I mean, I was, I was, I didn't really care. I was, I was just as much human. I was just as much male uh, before that sexual desire was aroused in me when I was a little boy. And I think the idea that Mitch is presenting here that we'll, we'll be like little boys and that uh, uh, we won't have that desire just as we didn't when I when I was you know eight years old you know I, I didn't think about that at all so uh, I don't see why uh, it won't be the same way uh, in eternity so I think Mitch uh, you can home run on that Mitch I agree uh, now he says um, will we be reunited with infants who have died um, this is an interesting question here uh, Brother Austin just sent me an email last night about kind of related to this question, uh, but uh, I wanted to save that for one of these hangouts we do when we start answering people's questions they send in. But I guess we need to get into this now. Uh, before we look at Randy's answer, what, what's your reaction? Will we be reunited with infants who have died? I don't see any reason why. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's that's all I had to say. No, um, I, I agree. Um, there's no reason to believe why we wouldn't. I, I tend to be of the belief, as others do, that um, they won't be infants. I, I, I think they'll be of an adult, what we consider an adult age. Um, but those infants who have died, yeah, absolutely. I think we, we absolutely will be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, we discussed this a little bit in an earlier episode about uh, the people that uh, are our children. Um, now I'm one. I'm one that believes that um, uh, we we are born uh, with this sin nature, and uh, even before we commit a sin, we're still a sinner by nature, and therefore, because we have this kind of sin condition, this sin disease in us, in our genes, that we're unacceptable, and that needs to be healed and cured and reversed through uh, regeneration through faith in Jesus. Uh, and so I think even a babies or children, even though we think of them as innocent, they still have this condition, this uh, mm -hmm. sin nature. And therefore, I don't think that they are saved. See, if a person believes that a, a, pers a baby comes out of the womb is saved, then we have to think that at a certain point they lose their salvation because uh, as soon as they reach this age of accountability or start committing sins, now they're, they're accountable and now they're lost. So they were born saved and then they get lost and they've got to get saved again. So I've never held to that in the age of accountability. So what do you do with the little children? You know, someone that's one year old or four or five years old or ten, six years old, what happens to them? Do they go either to an eternal hell or, 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 or do they automatically say, Jesus says, well, all the little children get saved. I'm going to give them eternal life anyway, even though they never put their faith in me. Uh, we have to really like wiggle around and contort to make it all work. That's why my viewpoint on, on uh, um, uh, annihilation and perishing it, to me makes more sense and that uh, we don't need to argue that whole case again. But uh, to have little children go to hell uh, forever, uh, anybody go to hell forever is, is extreme beyond my, my understanding. So I, I think that they get just be found lacking. They don't. They never receive eternal life, and they just perish and no longer exist. Uh, and that would be for an adult or even a little child that never received uh, received eternal life. But if if you believe that that the children that, that we don't perish like that, and they're the case, the the end result will either be eternal life in heaven or eternal life in eternal torment in hell. Then you have to find out, ask yourselves, what about the little children? Um, do, are they born saved and they lose it? Do they have to get saved at a certain point? And uh, what, what, how do well, you make that all fit? Well, I was going to say, um, I don't know if you, how, how much you wanted to cover this, to, to venture a, a half agreement, half disagreement with your opinion and have another perspective to offer out there for other people who might be watching too is what I think is I do also share the belief um, that children are not born innocent. Uh, we're all born with this thing, sin, and this is where people have a confusion about sin. You know, the acts of sinning, yes, they are sins, but they are just a manifestation of sin that dwells in us. It's not really the, the essence of sin. Sin is already in you, and it causes you to want, to desire to do these things. And this we're told in the scripture, in Psalms, I forget which psalm it was, but we're told even in the womb, when we're in the womb, we, we have this, okay? So... 
Um, my take on that is because I'm not annihilationist, and I know you are, so just to give a different take, um, is yes, I do agree they're not born sinless, but I believe in that instance this is where the grace of God steps in, and it's his prerogative to say in that instance where I am certain and I know the hearts of these individuals who never could possibly have the opportunity to to even deal with the situation, my grace is sufficient for these these. Um, I happen to believe that. So that's my belief on that. Um, there's a very interesting answer to the question. The answer to the question is really, we don't have an answer to this question. And there may be a very good reason for that in Scripture, which is we're not meant to know the answer to that question. Um, if God wanted us to know the answer, he'd tell us clearly. Um, so this is something to me, in my opinion, um, that is, it's something for him, it's not for us. It's something for him to be concerned with. Yeah. Um, we, could, we could very easily do a two-hour talk just on this one question. Oh, well, probably. <laughs> for, the, for the sake of for the sake of time, let me ask Mitch to make any comment he wants, and then we'll we'll move on. I think that was a good point that Eric made, uh, but I, I kind of think that nobody's going to know who's going to be in heaven. Nobody's going to really know who's going to be there. You know, uh, uh, you can guess, and who knows what God will do in the womb. What Christ can do, to to in the womb, will will children will, will the the children that were snuffed out early, the aborted children, the ones will 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 Jesus have had visited them, before either they were aborted or 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 they died prematurely, I don't know. Nobody has the answer to that question, but I do know God is a, a just God and a God of surprises. So I can't I can't speak for God, but I do know that that, that it, it it tends. To, I wonder if God was sitting up in heaven and going, you know what, I'm going to surprise everybody with what I do, not with what people think I'm going to do. And that's just the way I think. You know, I don't, I don't know. I just, you know, you don't know, I don't know. But I really kind of think that because God is a just God, people will be pointing the finger at God, going, well, uh, you know, the, the, the children they had never sinned yet. Well, everyone knows that they were born in, that, that they were conceived in sin, but nobody knows what God is going to do about that. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I think Mitch's I think Mitch's answer was great. I, I think you know Mitch kind of you know he said he said well that's just how I think but but you know it makes far more sense to not be presumptuous and say what we talk about this all the time let's not be dogmatic on this this is clearly an issue for God it's not for us um, just as Mitch said people can say all the live long day oh yeah I'm saved I believe it but God only really knows God really knows who's actually say who actually does believe who actually truly does believe so um, again I, I think Mitch is right and I go back to the whole thing of saying it's for God it's not for us it's not revealed and so we're not meant to know okay um, interesting uh, viewpoints on all on this and I think this subject deserves a much uh, longer talk some other time, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to coming back to this on another Hangout, but uh, for now let's move on so we can get through this heaven topic. Um, uh, so will we re be reunited with infants who have died? Um, uh, a doctrine of infant salvation, well, I think we pretty much already just discussed that uh, mm -hmm. best we could here. Now, who will our friends be in heaven? Augustine and Aquinas, uh-oh, if I, if I talk about them, someone's going to say, man, you're, you're friends with Augustine and Aquinas, man, you're <laughs> just a heretic. Uh, well, Augustine and Aquinas, two of history's most influential theologians, imagined that in heaven people would focus exclusively on God and that relationships between human beings would be minimal or insignificant. These great theologians were swayed by Christoplatonism. For the most part, they didn't seem to grasp that the eternal heaven will be on earth, where people will live and work in a relational society glorifying God, not merely as individuals but as a family, in rich relationship with each other. Uh, near the end of his life, however, Augustine significantly changed his view of heaven. He said, we have not lost our dear ones who have departed from this life, but have merely sent them ahead of us, so we also shall depart and shall come to that life where they will be more than ever dear as they will be better known to us and where we shall love them without fear of parting. He also said, all of us who enjoy God are also enjoying each other in him. 
So the question is, uh, uh, how how much is is our eternal life in the eternal heaven going to be relationships among our, ourselves, and, and, and uh, compared to just our relationship with 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 God? Uh, it, some people want to make the case that the relationships with either either other is either non-existent or minimal, and it's just going to be all about our relationship with God. No opinion. Well, there's a lot of opinions on that. Oh yeah, I got. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I know. I know the people here on the panel, and I know there's a lot of opinions about that. Um, now, I'd I'd say I I really kind of shudder to think that people would consider them to be theologians when they couldn't get past something that I think consider as a very simple point. Um, God made us to fellowship with one another to to experience brotherly love on the planet, to exercise brotherly love to our, our, uh, to others. Um, he meant for us to have these relationships. He doesn't do that for no reason. He certainly doesn't do it to turn around, strip it away. Um, that's not what God does. He doesn't do that. Um, so I really don't even think this is a complicated thing where these guys would have a hang up on that. And it would have to be something like the book says, you know, Christ of Platonism that is really influencing their belief to say, well, I want to feel this way, but because of this, um, no, it's got to all be about God. It can't be about anything else besides God. And well, we know what happens when that when people go down that road. It's not, it's, it's not all just about God. It's about much much more. But He is the greatest the greatest part of it. Okay. Um, the, his question is who will be our who will our friends be in heaven? So the question is how much will friendship be a part of it? And then exactly who will be your friend? Uh, he says, just because we'll be sinless doesn't mean we won't be drawn to certain people more than others. We'll like everyone, but we'll be closer to some than others. Jesus was closer to John than to any of the other disciples, so on. In heaven, there won't be cliques, exclusiveness, arrogance, posturing, belittling, or jealousy. But when friends particularly enjoy each other's company, they're reflecting God's design. Uh, so... Uh, in other words, is, is it going to be wrong that uh, you know Eric's going to be prefer to hang out with Mitch much more than me? Um, I don't know. Uh, will I be hurt by it? Uh, will it be like, will I say, look, they formed their own little clique, those guys? Yeah, <laughs> oh, I know who I'm not going to hang around with. Yet. Who? <laughs> you know, oh, I know all of those free grace people. You know, they. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hang out with these people, these gods on earth, you know. I, I'm going to be hanging out with, uh, you know, some of the, the big wigs up there. The big maybe, wigs. maybe James the Just, you know, me and him hang up. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to really hunt him down in particular. I want to have a talk with him. Oh, I, th I think that he's saved. I think I think that he, later in life, he was martyred for, for going going. Uh, against Jewish law, and I think that 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 uh, he he actually um, he'll be up there, and I think I think we'll be friends. I, th I think, I think, we'll think yeah, I, I agree with you entirely, and I think James I think James is up there right now, and he deals with this on a constant basis, and new people come into him every time they go to heaven, kind of going, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you writing? Oh. I know this is an issue. I know, but I think I think there's another side to this, Luke, which is that you know, look, again, look at it from the other perspective, which is yeah, we're gonna have who our friends be, those we know and love, those we're most associated with, who we know. But then you know, heaven becomes maybe that's really what heaven's gonna be about. It's gonna be about constantly building new relationships and new friendships and expanding your friendships and relationships to the rest of your family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but uh, some people would think that everybody's going to be like equally loved and equally friendship, you know, and you're not going to have favorites, but is there any reason to think that you're not going to prefer some people over others in, in eternal heaven, you know, that uh, some of your old friends and families, or maybe you'll meet some new people and they'll be so interesting that maybe you won't have as much time for some of the old ones because you're so involved with them. And but at least we won't have these petty jealousies and hurt feelings. I, I don't think anymore. No, I, I, I. What was that, Austin? There won't be any loners. Can you no turn loners. up your volume, bud? I said there won't be any loners. Thank any you. Loners. That just broke right. my ear. There you go. He came, he came in loud and clear that time. Um, <laughs> No, I, I agree with Austin. I think, I think, but but at the same time, what Luke was saying, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with having preferred people you want to hang out with because they're people you knew. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's, I mean, I I think if you if it if it's to the point of neglecting 
other relationships that need to be made, well, yeah, that could be a potential problem, but I think, of course, there's going to be a propensity, I think, for people to want to share right away, you know, all the things that they're going to be experiencing with those who they know and love. They, they want to share it with those people. Plus, remember, you know, eternity is kind of a long time. So you're, you're going to have, like, a long time to have lots of friendships and spend time with each other. There's because, I mean, you know, there, there, there won't be any lack of time. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, that's true. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to have to worry about, I mean, maybe I won't have time for you today, uh, Brother Mitch, you know. It's no, got, it's no problem. I've got other people to hang with. I know. You've got plenty of other people, <laughs> and, and there's plenty of other days. It's not like we're running out of time, you know. That's yeah. a very good point. Uh, Brother uh, brother Austin, introduce yourself since you just joined the show. I apologize. I was just at a uh, – I was called on the presence to help a uh, fellow brother witness to an atheist, so I was in a discussion oh. with him. Great. Uh, uh, sorry to discuss who I am. I'm, uh, my name is Austin Bill, and I run an uh, online ministry here called Christ Ministries. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to turn your volume up here a little bit because you're a little low there. Uh, all right, go ahead and talk just, again. Just in between, yeah. Talk Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah I, tur I just turned your volume up on my control panel there, so. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let me give. Well, uh, that's for that's for Austin joining us. Uh, even though he's late, it's we'd rather have him late than not at all. Okay, so now the question is, in chapter I didn't 30, get any applause when I came on. <laughs> uh, what yeah. is this? You know, I, I, I see favoritism going on over here. You know, yeah. this is... <laughs> I'm going to give you double applause of the net. <laughs> no, it's too late now. You blew that. <laughs> hey, he's a young man that he needs even more encouragement. You're just an old... Geezer. I don't need encouragement. It's an old Okay, so <laughs> chapter 36 is, Whom will we meet and what will we experience together? In heaven, will we spend time with people whose lives are recorded in Scripture and church history? No doubt, Jesus told us we'll sit at the dinner table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Matthew chapter 8. If we sit with them, we should expect to sit with others. What do, do people do at dinner tables? In Middle Eastern cultures, dinner was and is not only about good food and drink, but also a time for building relationships, talking together, and telling stories. Hmm. So, uh, who will be cooking the food? I guess people uh, will be cooking the what? We'll people cooking the food? And will, will, will it will it be will it be polite to burp? Maybe everything's going to be raw. If we're going to be vegan, raw vegans in eternity. No need for cooking. I, I have no idea. I mean, you can cook vegetables, but I'm just wondering if you know if if, if belching is a, is a compliment to the cook. I, I you know because in some cultures that's you know. You know, and I could be sitting next to Jacob well, and wow, you know. If, 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 I, if I can't get a nice grilled steak, uh, I'm going to have a problem. <laughs> that, that's going to be a problem for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, if our loved ones are in hell, won't that spoil heaven? Okay, uh, I won't get back into my uh, annihilationist uh, viewpoint here for a moment, but just taking his viewpoint that there are going to be people eternally tormented in hell, would that spoil heaven for you if you knew that some of the people you knew are uh, suffering in hell? In hell? Boy, way to really flop the conversation. <laughs> that really is. <laughs> yeah, you see, it's a bummer even bringing it up now. It really, yeah. it really is, and it's it's a good question because it's even something you deal with today every every time any one of us, and at the age, you know, at least at why, and I know Austin's dealt with this already in his young age too, um, dealing with funerals and things of that, and the passing of loved ones. You get mixed situation because you don't know who was saved. You you know you 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 know you think you know who was saved, and we tend to again. I think we tend to focus on how we feel now, but you know I I tried to explain that to someone that when we are perfected in heaven and we're resurrected and we have the understanding that God's going to give us of His perfect justice and the way things need to be, we're going to have a way of accepting these things as His perfect justice. For what it is, it's it's. Remember, you're going to be different as a person. That I know, as a human being, you tend to focus on that. And think, why well, couldn't be happy? 
knowing a loved one didn't come to heaven with me, but I, I don't think that's true. I, I think you will be because that won't be your focus, um, and you will see it in a much different way than you see it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you will see it in a different way. That's that's for sure. So if you if you're in heaven, and uh, the, you realize that someone you love and cared about uh, is not there, and therefore the default the d- default destination is hell with eternal torment. Uh, you you wouldn't be bothered by it if you everything's perfectly okay then. No, I I don't think I think you would have the capacity in the new person that you are in righteousness in in who you are as a new person a new a new being. Um, yeah, you'll have the ability to understand that and accept it. Yeah, if I held to eternal torment, I would have to say, well, it's God's just, so He's doing what is just, and I just have to accept His just verdict on this. Uh, but uh, I, as I said before, I I think that they uh, no longer exist. They're not being tormented, but they no longer exist. That would be far more uh, acceptable to me. Austin, what do you what do you uh, see on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I've leaned both ways on this. Uh, I could go where uh, I'm still I'm still really thinking that one out. I don't really try to think too much of that, but uh, when I do, I think that the control torment theory applies. I would think that we wouldn't be subjugated to know that, uh, you know, since it's such a severe form of judgment, I don't think we'd be subjugated to know that they exist there. I, don't, I just think that they would be, be forgotten. Uh, oh. And then I would say that if they, uh, and then I, my, the theory that I'm trying to, to get a foot on is that, yeah, they, uh, they suffer for everything they've done, and then once they're, uh, once hell and death are cast in the lake of fire, it's just, it's all, it's all taken up. It's all, uh, the second death's been applied. It's already done. Everything's everything's taken care of. There, so it's kind of. Yeah. But uh, that's my views. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard anybody take the position that uh, we we just will be like our memory will be uh, wiped clean of of uh, it, in the hell, and that we won't be having knowledge of, of of it. But that's interesting. Maybe that is the case. At, at least if if you didn't realize that anybody was in hell to being tor tormented, then it obviously wouldn't bother you because you don't even know about it. Okay, his next question is, will we ever disagree? <laughs> yes. Dad, where's the fun in life without disagreeing? Um, I, I, absolutely, I'm sorry. This is, now, again, maybe, maybe we're all doing what we're saying we do wrong here, which is thinking with our human minds. Maybe we won't. Um I, 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 again, I want to say one thing. People, just because you disagree on something, Luke, you did a great video about arguing and that arguing's good. And just because you disagree on something doesn't mean it's bad or one person's bad over the other one. It means you could just disagree. For instance, um, I may love lobster. Mitch may hate lobster. We disagree on that as far as thinking it's wonderful. But that doesn't make it something that's bad. It just makes it something we disagree on. So, um uh, yeah, I think we. I, yes, I think we will disagree. Yeah, well, Mitch is not under kosher law, so he loves lobster too now. I think I think Saint Peter and me are going to get along just fine because he was kosher his whole life, and then uh, he started eating pork. With yeah, the, with he the, found with out the what the he was pepper. missing. <laughs> he was eating with the Italians, man. He was eating some good. You he know, had he had some bacon, and uh, it's found out what he was missing. He was like, "Wow, this is good stuff." Yeah, he, well, to me, since you mentioned my video, I was going to actually mention it too. It's a, the, the title is um, "Arguing is Good," and my my point in the video that's it's like thirty minute video. I'll, I'll explain it in, in uh, you know fifteen seconds. Is that when we argue with each other, we can learn. Um, uh, it, it, uh, arguing is is only bad if you if emotions get involved and anger. And, and uh, then, uh, then it's it, it's, it's uh, raised to something different than arguing. It's 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 fighting. It's it's nastiness. But if a person like we just disagreed on eternal torment and hell, and nobody got angry about it, so that's the kind of arguing that's healthy because you learn from each other. Okay. I was just going to uh, say too is that uh, that defines our personality that we have. We all have preferences, so I I, I would I don't see why we would. That would be getting uh, get rid of. I think that would always happen. Yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, there's a saying. I I, I make sure I, I quoted this saying in uh, uh, in the video too. Is that uh, if and I heard this referred to businessmen in in business, 
if two men always agree, one of them is unnecessary. I mean, why do you need an executive? If, if, I, can, if I understand everything that, that Eric understands and I don't have any different opinion on it, then, then you can say, well, I only need Luke. Luke, we don't need Eric. Luke, can, Luke knows everything Eric knows, and there's, they, did, they agree, so let's just get rid of Eric. One of them's unnecessary. So uh, I find it not only to be unnecessary if you're if you, uh, always in agreement, uh, but but it was certainly less interesting. I mean, I like to hear other people's opinions. I like to hear people say, Luke, I think you're wrong, and this is why. And uh, sometimes they convince me I was wrong, and sometimes they don't, you know. Real fast, too, that, that brings up a good point. I, I understand that God's not a respecter of persons, but I, I would wonder if he has a preference of certain things that he made, like a, like a favorite color or something along that line. That'd be cool to know. A favorite color of mine or God's? I'd just be, I'm just using an example. Like maybe God has a certain preference to things. Since he made everything, there, you know, because he says he enjoys, uh, like I believe it's like he enjoys sunsets and something else. He, he enjoys Jerusalem. I'd ask him why. You know, there's a reason. I think he has preferences. It'd be cool to find out what they are. I wonder if he gets flurple, you know, in heaven. He, he probably invents new colors. You know, like, like you know, like like orange. You know what, what is that? <laughs> okay, the next question he asks is, will we share discoveries together? Many friendships emerge from shared experiences. Doing things together bonds us. The same will be true on the new earth. We'll be knit together as we discover together the wonders of God and His universe. Um. Yeah, we've talked a lot about this in the past too, but to me that's one of the exciting things is when we understand, well actually I can't understand, when I ponder the vastness of creation, the universe, I don't understand it. I'm, my, it boggles my mind, uh, you know, the, the size of it. When we talk about how, how the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and then you travel that speed for a year, that's called a light year. Uh, and then, and then uh, let's say that for distance from here to another galaxy is is uh, you know 10 to the 22nd power light years. I'm, that just is boggling my mind. I can't even put my mind around these distances and size of creation. And then when I think about eternity, it goes on and on and on, and on never end. And it just it, it's another thing. My mind can't really grasp it. So uh, the, during all that time. And within all that space, all the experiences that we're going to be enjoying and learning and discovering, that is really exciting to me. And uh, I really hope that uh, I don't get off distracted with a bunch of new friends and I can spend a lot of time discovering with you guys. Amen. But uh, I'm definitely having a good time down here, you know. So, But after 10,000 years, or maybe 10 million years... <laughs> You know, I don't know if we're going to still be hanging around the same people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get sick of someone's face after a while. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's, it's like, no offense, Eric, but, you know, I've been looking at you for 10,000 years. i got to look at something else. I'm sorry. It's, it's just... <laughs> okay, we're going to go to Chapter 37 now, and... Uh, uh, he says, how will we relate to each other? How will we treat each other? We'll experience all the best human relationships with none of the worst. The burdens and tragedies of life will be lifted from us. We'll be free of what displeases God and damages relationships. No abortion clinics or psychiatric wards. No missing children. No rape or abuse. No drug rehabilitation centers. No bigotry, muggings, or killings. No worry, depression, or economic downturns. No wars, no unemployment, no anguish over failure and miscommunication. No pretense or wearing masks. No cliques, no hidden agendas, backroom deals, betrayals, secret ambitions, plots, or schemes. Imagine mealtimes meal full of stories, laughter, and joy without fear of insensitivity, inappropriate behavior, anger, gossip, lust, jealousy, hurt feelings, or anything that eclipses joy. That will be heaven. Wow. I don't know what else to say after that. 
I, I have an interesting perspective on that, I think. And I've had this conversation with people how I how I relate to them, you know, when I say, look, if you if you want to know a way to live your life, you know, you gotta search God's word, you gotta ask him. I've tried to lead people in study groups and things of that nature, and I tell them always, you can't truly trust anyone besides God because everybody will let you down. Everybody will let you down in some way. I'll let you down. Family members will let you down. It doesn't matter how much you love each other because of sin, it's our nature to do such a thing. In heaven, our relating to each other will be based on the premise of you know you're getting the real deal from everybody that you're dealing with. You don't have that here. You, you, you don't – there's always in the back of your mind, is this person really honest with me? Are they lying to me? Can I trust what they're saying? You won't have that in heaven. It will be a very unique relationship that we've never known to where you would feel comfortable in anyone's presence because you know none of them would ever stab you in the back. None of them would ever fail you anymore. None of them would wrong you. None of them would lie to you. None of them would cheat you. Um, we, we've never known being in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, when he talks about we'll have none of this and none of that, that list, uh, to be able to get rid of all of that, it, I, I mean, it's so, I'm so happy to know that all that is gone, and then all, only these good attributes are going to be remain. It's uh, that's gets me really excited about the future. We'll talk about friends. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit is with us here on Earth, but only only in small measure, only a a deposit. When we're in heaven. The Holy Spirit will be with us all the time. We will be always with Jesus, but our relationship, the love for other people, will pour out of us through that Spirit. So it won't be, it won't be exactly in Jesus' face all the time, but that Spirit of love and grace will come out of us, and it will fellowship with others. So, so, so it's not as if we're, you know, there are times when I'll probably be like Jesus where he wants to be alone with God, with the Father, mm -hmm. fellowshipping. Well, there'll be probably times when we will be alone, fellowshipping with, with with the Father. But relationally on Earth, sure, there would, wouldn't it be one? I mean, it's, uh, everybody's on the same page. Everyone loves one another, and the Spirit of God is 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 working through us all, and the Spirit of Christ is with us by His grace and through His love. Amen. Amen. Um, now, here's an interesting question. Will all people be equal? All people are equal in worth, but they differ in gifting and performance. God is the creator of diversity, and diversity means inequality of gifting. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because God promises to reward people differently according to their different levels of faithfulness in this life, we should not expect equality of possessions and positions in heaven. You know, we talked about this a lot in previous uh, discussions uh, about, uh, uh, you know, built, Jesus said, build up your treasures in heaven. And Paul talked about the Bema seat and then receiving rewards of gold, silver, and precious gems. And, and, uh, and so we know that uh, not everybody is going to, and, and also having our various roles, ruling over one city or one, someone else ruling over five cities. So we see over and over again this point that we're not going to be equal because based upon our ministries and how much we've grown and matured and served in our ministries, uh, our status and everything else is going to be very. But some people would interpret that as that this is not fair, it's not right, and you know they think of communism and everybody absolutely equal in every way uh, to be the, the only thing that's really fair. But I know... What, what's your reaction to, to that, this idea that people think it's, hey, it's, it's unequal, it's, it's not right? There won't be any feeling of, of, of um, inferiority, I don't think. I don't think one person will lord it over the other person because they'll all, in humility, serve. And uh, as Jesus said, you know, um, the, 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 one, the one that will be above will be the one first, the first will come last. Well, if you take on that attitude, no matter what your position is, it doesn't matter from one person to the other. It's all fellowship and joy. It's totally different than what we would see on earth where other people lord it over one another. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll have a very high position in heaven. I decided, you know, before I didn't think about it, but I really want to be above everybody here. <laughs> And, and no, I'm serious, you know. And I need people to take care of my lawn, you know. And and, and I need, you know, I need servants, you know, because of course well, I should be, I should have a high position in heaven, and I definitely need, you know. I, you guys would be and, good at this. You know? And what and what you're seeing now, this is Mitch's way of assuring that he's not going to get a high position in heaven, <laughs> because he's he's saying he wants it. Cause he, he's like, no, nah, I want low profile. <laughs> yeah. I want people uh, lawn. <laughs> I think uh, Mitch is, uh, uh, has said before that you know that he's just very going to be very happy if he just has a small little condo, doesn't need a big mansion, and he doesn't doesn't need all those rewards and something. But, but uh, I'm I'm I believe that after he finishes his book on James, that he's going to probably have so many rewards in heaven for that for such a great uh, uh, enlightenment that he's giving people. That he might end up having uh, like the big mansion and a bunch of other stuff, and I hope it doesn't go to his head. <laughs> oh, it will, <laughs> absolutely, and I'll enjoy every minute of it. <laughs> okay, so another uh, another type of inequality he goes on to say is there's no reason to believe we'll all be equally tall or strong, or that we'll have the same gifts, talents, or intellectual capacities. If we all had the same gifts, uh, they wouldn't be special. If you can do some things better than I can, and I, I than you, then we'll have something to offer each other. Uh, I don't have any problem with that, uh, but I know that some people would. Some people would really object to the idea that some people are going to be superior to others in one way or another, and, and that, that and other people will be inferior in other ways. Uh, but well, uh, that, that doesn't really uh, strike me as a negative thing at all, because Everybody is going to be so full of happiness and joy, and everybody's going to be receiving so so much. Even if you were, let's say, the poorest person in heaven, like you're the thief on the cross or something, you didn't do one thing. You just you just believed on Jesus, and then you died, and and you didn't have any other any rewards or treasures or crowns or anything else. You think this guy is going to be complaining? He's just going to be so happy that he's in heaven forever, not in hell. And you know he's just not going to be complaining at all. As good as I am in heaven, you have nothing to complain about. So you know, because I'm better than everybody else in every in, in, in every circumstance, and, and and you know, you guys shouldn't even have a problem with that, because of course, you know, you know, you you should be humbled by the idea that that that, that won't matter in heaven. It doesn't matter to me, you know, at all. Okay. Sorry for being so facetious, but. It's just such a well, I'm glad you're you're making this uh, uh, point that you're facetious because somebody who doesn't know you might think you're you're really a <laughs> egotist, a maniacal egotist. I was thinking the same thing. So somebody's watching this right now. It's like, see, see, look at that, that Mitch. Mitch, oh. listen to him. He wants to run the whole show. Uh, yeah, we can't <laughs> let him on. The, you know, we got to make attack videos on this guy. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mitch, ahead, Mitch is actually knock yourself out. Mitch is really the opposite of what he just said there. He was being facetious, uh, using uh, uh, so, using sarcasm as a method. Well, method you know what? There's another side of the argument too, which is, and it's funny through Mitch being facetious. I want to use that as a learning experience because he's joking about that, but he's right because, you know, the person, when we get into heaven, we are each going to have an appreciation for what we're receiving based on what we've done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it, when you get there, you will you will totally understand why you've received what you received. You'll have no reason to complain, and you'll know this. You'll know this in your heart. You'll know this with all your being because it'll be explained to you by the Lord Himself, who's going to explain these reasons to you. So there's no reason to not like it or dislike it or 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 be you know uh, envious of somebody else because you're going to be able to accept it based on the fact that you're going to know justly you've received exactly what you should. Uh, let me say something else while we're on this topic uh, and uh, tell you about something I did uh, be beginning of the show today. Uh, you you all know brother Chad Inward Burn. Uh, I sent him a invitation to join our hangouts, and uh, I'm hoping that he'll decide to join us. But you know he is uh, he made a video 
showing a glass of water like being poured on and it's overflowing. And I think that kind of relates to what we're saying right now. You know, the, the Lord, the Scripture says, "My cup runneth over." Uh, and I think everybody, the thief on the cross, his cup runneth over. Everybody's cup is going to runneth over. It, you know, who's going to care if yours is running up over even more than mine? <laughs> you know, you're, we're so going to be so completely unhappy and satisfied and fulfilled uh, that that we'd be lacking nothing. So, what's the thing you're worried about, about to these disparities, you know? Exactly. I was just, just going to say real fast, too, is that I don't see why uh, we wouldn't be allowed to share our rewards. Share our rewards? Hey, hey brother, look at that. Oh, I can see Mitch is jealous again. because I'm, I'm not sharing oh, any of my rewards. Not sharing. They're my no, rewards. That's a, you know what? You know, that's like Austin... I, I've never heard anybody make that comment before, and I'm sorry to say that I've never heard that before because, you know, once they're your rewards and they're given to you, who, who's to say that you can't share what you've received? And that's um, that that that's a that was a very inspired uh, comment. Very good. It was. It was. It was profound, inspired, unique. Nobody has ever said that to my knowledge. Thank you. God. I um, I think I think you uh, you uh, the, the Holy Spirit gave you that, brother. Yeah, give it, give the credit to the FI. I just, I'm just a messenger. <laughs> okay, uh, here's an interesting question, Mitch. The next question is, will we have privacy in heaven? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew that was the an answer. <laughs> uh, he's Randy, Randy Alcorn says some people understand heaven as a place of complete communal living, where we'll always be with others and there will be no privacy. Scripture speaks of having our own individual dwelling places, which indi indicates privacy, Luke chapter 16. In the context of the new earth, God says to his servants, he will give another name, Isaiah 65. Similarly, Jesus says, I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. A name known only to the recipient, and God is private indicating God will relate to us as individuals, not just as one large group. That's interesting. Well, I know, just speaking for me personally, I know I'm going to need some privacy at least at first. And, and it's, going to take, it's going to take a while because I'm going to need some time just to be able to sit there by myself and contemplate everything that's just happened. <laughs> I mean... It, it's going to take a while for that to sink in and and to absorb it all. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I uh, I don't know how I'm going to feel about privacy. I mean, I'm, I sometimes I really need my privacy now. Uh, sometimes my wife interrupts my privacy at the worst possible times. <laughs> Just amazing. She decides she wants to have a conversation with me at the worst time. And I'm so I know that privacy can be very important sometimes. I believe we'll have it. What's that? I, I said I believe we'll have it. Yeah, well guess what? There's gonna be plenty of space in the universe. <laughs> right. If you want to go off and be alone, there's plenty yeah, of space. It, it won't be for lack of space, that's for sure. Uh, now the next question is will there be private ownership? Uh, the 14th century theolo the Theologica Germanica says, In heaven there is no ownership. If any, th if, if any there took upon him to call anything his own, he would straightway be thrust out into hell and become an evil spirit. <laughs> well, before I go into Randy's answer, what is your reaction to that? Well, I... I'm glad I never wasted any time reading the Theologica Germanica, um, because that <laughs> comment is truly uninspired, unlike Austin's previous comment. Um, uh, it's a pretty ridiculous comment, actually. Um, uh, of course there will be ownership. I mean, we're told that there are going to be rewards given to us based on our service for what we've done. These pertain exactly to us based on what we've done personally. It, that says ownership. I mean, these things are yours to bless you. So, wh why do these? Again, this this is again back to that thing, Luke, that you said. With the for some reason, people think that um, uh, 
communism is like the greatest thing, and this is that's that's why it's got to be that way, and which is truly truly to show that communism has truly created a great illusion in trying to prove, trying to make you think that it's super wonderful when it's not. But um, this idea that no, it can, nothing can be personally yours, nothing can be personally yours. There's just something wrong with that. Why is there something wrong with that? I don't I don't understand what makes that inherently wrong. I I don't get it. Maybe it's me, but I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, plus, I mean, there are examples. Uh, I mean, for example, we are given our own uh, treasures. That's our, your own personal uh, treasures, uh, your own personal rewards and stuff. So there's plenty of examples of us receiving things that are just ours. So that's private ownership, isn't it? Well, well yeah. And well, the Bible also says we're going to be given a name that only we'll know. That that that's private ownership of something that God's going to give to us. Mm -hmm. This came from the Theologica Germans. Yeah. The they're Germans, right? I wonder yeah. what it would think at Oktoberfest if somebody grabbed his beer. <laughs> <laughs> just wondering, you know. Like, that's would, he just, would he just hand it over and say, oh, no, well, it's mine is yeah, yours, buddy. Yeah, Go ahead yeah, and take no, it. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, no. Keep your lips off of my, you know. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> No, I, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, th I think we will have uh, we will have possessions in heaven that will be ours that we we won't have to share with others. Yeah, but maybe we will will want to share. Uh, as uh, Austin said, that to me makes the most sense. Even though it's mine, <laughs> hey, if you want some of it, fine. My cup runneth over. I'll give you some. Whatever yeah. you want. I, I think it's going to be more like that. It's going to be in our nature to want to share these things, to have fun with these treasures, to to yeah. You know. Well, thing. having so much abundance, it really won't matter. But there might be some things that, 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 that we might have that are ours. But, of course, there's no possession more precious than Christ himself that Absolutely. will be within us, and those Amen. love will be there. Amen. Yeah. We're making some really good progress here. I'm sure that we're going to be able to finish this whole thing up next Sunday on, on heaven. That, that would be a good thing. I was just wanted to mention about this. What if Christ himself gave you an ornament? A, a garland to grace your neck or whatnot. It was a personal gift between you and Christ. Would that, you know, would that that gift would be yours? It would be precious to you, you know. Yes. Yeah. And I, I it would it would be precious to me, but if I decided to share it with you, loan it to you, let you use it sometimes, or give it to you, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I think I'd be, I'd, that, I'd be free to do that. Uh, and that may, may be in my nature to say, hey, I, I see how much you love this, and the Lord gave it to me, but Mitch, I want you to have it. Well, that's, that's our, I think everyone will respect everyone's property, but at the same time, and I don't think that there will be any problems with that whatsoever, because it, there will be love up there. But, but as far as having things that were given to you that are personal, I think that that, that that that's that's a fine thing as long as – and you'll have this in you. The balance will be that, that, that it all doesn't matter because we have all things fulfilled in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, we're on chapter 38, and his question is, what will New Earth society be like? Um, will we have ethnic and national identities? Yes. Is the risen – uh, Jesus Jewish? Certainly. Will we know he's Jewish? Of course. Our resurrected DNA will be unflawed, but it will preserve our God-designed uniqueness, racial and otherwise. Um, so in other words, uh, I mean, you're going to be who you are. You're going to maintain your own ethnicity, your race. Uh, if, if you didn't, then it wouldn't be you who was resurrected; It'd be somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and now he says, "The elders sing to the Lamb, 'You are worthy. Your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have caused them to become God's kingdom and His priests, and they will reign on the earth." Revelation chapter five. Who will serve as the new? Earth's kings and priests, not people who were formerly of every tribe, language, people, and nation. Their distinctions aren't obliterated, but continue into the intermediate heaven and then into the eternal heaven. So here he's using the language of uh, tribe, 
language, people, and nation to make the case that in eternity there will still remain tribes, nations, languages, ethnicities, peoples, and so on. What do you think? I mean, uh, these all these differences throughout our history is, is reasons why people just keep on wanting to fight, conquer each other, and not get along is because, you know, there's all these different borders and countries and ethnicities that, that won't accept each other. Uh, but I guess we won't have any issue with that in, in, uh, in eternity. But we'll have a culture. Culture is a beautiful thing. I love culture. Um, you know, and everybody has their own personal culture. I mean, that's one of the things that you might want to share with somebody else when you're in heaven is your, is your culture. You know, yeah. and, um, you know, if, if you're if you if you're Mexican, got some good enchiladas, you got some stuff here. We're gonna sit here and and eat and drink. Heaven. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of you. You know, and you know, if you're Jewish, hey, you know, you're Jewish. You know, we can have some nice kugel up in heaven. You never had kugel before, have you? <laughs> Kugel's like a potato dish. It's uh, it's it's uh, a Jewish thing. No, that yeah. that matzo. You know, I love that too. I do think that uh, uh, culture is is wonderful. Many people love their own cultures and prefer their own cultures. That's where they're comfortable. Uh, I had a guy once that uh, he and I were discussing uh, racism. And he said to me, he, said, he says, Luke, I, I'm not a racist, but I am a culturist. Uh, you know, I don't care what race a person is, but there are certain cultures that I just don't like. For example, he didn't like the culture of the inner city. You know, the gangs, the, 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 the gang culture, the drugs, the prostitution, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, all the babies born, born out of wedlock, and the, the culture of an inner city that is such a big problem. He says, I don't like that culture. It has nothing to do with someone's race. It's just the culture that I don't like. And so uh, I know that there are certain cultures. Uh, my first wife was Cuban, and I lived in Miami among all the Cubans, and I grew to love the Cuban culture a lot. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I love that uh, uh, various other cultures I've, I've been introduced to I love. And then there's also some other cultures that are not quite that interesting or, or appealing to me. So uh, I guess I think it would be perfectly wonderful for people to retain their cultures if that's what they love. But there might be some people that through eternity they might experience a different culture and say, hey, I'm more comfortable. I think I want to move over across the other side of town where that, that culture is more interesting to me. Well, first of all, culture, you realize that, that there won't be – culture will be better in heaven because people will be better in heaven, mm -hmm. you, first of all. Second, yeah. second of all, I don't want to be hanging out with you people. I want to be hanging out with some Japanese people in heaven, <laughs> um, some Chinese people. I'm, I'm up there for a long time. I'm going to get to know every culture and speak their language. I think there's going to be several languages up there, even tongue and then eating a lot of the cultural food, and, you know, and then whatever new cultures that might come up there, you know, there might be crosses, you know. But, you mm -hmm. know He's, he's pretty uh have you guys noticed that Mitch is quite quick and ready to just like discard us and move on <laughs> I got that you know, uh, you know it's not this, that I don't like you people it's just uh, you know, I'm really finding this quite revealing today yeah I'm oh, such man. a bad person you know, I'm <laughs> be, I love you guys I really do. <laughs> I'm uh, only saying that no I'm <laughs> Uh, but I do think that um, you just said something uh, about different languages, and that's the next question he has in the book. So that makes me suspicious that you uh, may have uh, what I call psychotic powers. Uh, you you knew what we were going to talk about next. You you have you're psychotic, right? Psychotic. <laughs> psychotic. <laughs> Yes, Mitch know. has psychotic powers. I don't know about my behavior being psychotic, but <laughs> Mitch you know. knew the next question in the book. And therefore, he has psychotic powers. Psychotic. It was more like clairvoyance. <laughs> you know, who, what do I know? Uh, okay, so what language will we speak? He says. He says, "Could God allow us to understand all languages, even if we can't speak them?" Um, science fiction portrays this with a universal translator, whatever that is. But Scripture seems to suggest more. Uh, the, Bab the Babel accounts 
the Babel account offers clues as to the importance of shared language in an ideal society. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Genesis chapter 11. So uh, we learn from that that God didn't want man to have a common language, uh, and but in, in eternity, uh, would we have a common language? Uh, or is everybody going to still speak the languages that they uh, spoke uh, you know, in their first life? Oh, I think that we're going to have a lot of time mixing with people in heaven to begin with. I don't know. And this, this goes to um, whether I really want to know everything when I get there. Because I want to discover when I get there. So mm -hmm. I, I would, uh, you know, me being a person who loves foreign languages, I, I, don't, I don't want to have them just come to me. I, I, want, to I want to have the pleasure, actually, you know, the job for me to, to actually learn it and write it and, and read it. Uh, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like up there. But, um, you know, I, I think that God knows. Uh, just, just my thought here that, that we're going to go up there and we're going to be there for a long time. And, we're, and our brains aren't going to be so dull, so I think we're, we're, we'll probably speak uh, several languages, if, if not everybody, by the time, you know, uh, 10 million years goes by, I think everybody can be pretty Yeah. Happy. I would think that if, if uh, we have uh, perfect bodies with perfect brains and, that, and, and our, our intelligence will be so good that we will be able to learn and understand many languages, uh, uh, or maybe through some supernatural uh, endowment God places on us will be able to like like it uh, in, uh, in Pentecost where you spoke whatever I'm speaking right now if people un didn't understand English but they listened to me they would understand me in their own language yeah so I was just gonna I was just gonna say the same thing the Bible may kind of hint at this through what happened in the early church with the gift of tongues and they you know they spoke and yet one person was speaking get all these different people of different languages understood what they were saying. So maybe there's a little bit of a hint there. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe uh, um, that that time was was a sign mm -hmm. of um, you know uh, of the, the 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 gospel actually going out not right. just not just in this area but uh, but but uh, sp uh, spread uh, throughout mm -hmm. throughout the land. Sure. So I don't I, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like in heaven, but I think probably you'll be able to turn it on and just listen to it anytime you want, but. Like I said before, I really want to have some challenges up there. I, I you know, I want to be able to do things. Maybe uh, um, maybe we won't have to learn a language. We'll just speak, and everybody will understand us as they did in uh, in uh, uh, Pentecost. Uh, I mean, that seems to me to be a very useful thing for God to bestow on us. Uh, but maybe we won't even speak language. Maybe we will just read each other's minds. Maybe we won't really have to speak. Nah, I like talking. I don't like this. I might, be, I might be able to read your mind, Mitch, and find out, you know, if you prefer someone else over me. You know what? I'll tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> see, and that's why Mitch, see, Luke, stop that, because that's why Mitch doesn't want to hang out with us anymore, because he doesn't want anybody in his head. And he knows you <laughs> in his head. He, he want wants his private space, and he wants his private thoughts. <laughs> he wants his privacy. He wants his cranium to stay his cranium. <laughs> now, one, yeah, I, I don't need everybody up in my brain here. No. He, probably wouldn't even, he probably wouldn't even share his big giant mug of beer with me. Heck no, get your own beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, would have a, I will have a great time with all of you up there. And, and, and although I'm joking around, I, I, I think that we're going to have a great time together. But well, then again, already, after I've already decided I'm going to be making new friends and moving on, Mitch. <laughs> you might not want to hang out with me anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I think I'm gonna be looking up the Apostle Paul, hanging out with him. Uh, you're hanging with him. You got to take James. I got Paul. <laughs> Paul and Peter are my friends, man. You can't hang out with our crowd. I okay. got John. All you right. got John. Oh man, he was my. Oh. All right, fine. You got it, John. <laughs> can have it. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'll trade uh, you two for. No, never mind. <laughs> uh, he says. Um, 
referring back to this this idea that uh, the Torah of Babel, he says, if one people speaking the same language they be, uh, have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Uh, in Genesis 11, he says, when the human heart is evil, that's bad. But the human heart is righteous, that's good. On the new earth, all we propose to do will be for God's glory and our good. God will no longer need to protect us from ourselves. We will never quite, we will never unite to destroy and exploit, only to create and enhance. A shared language will likely be God's gift to empower us. So uh, in Babel, you know, the shared language was a problem, and God had to end it. But in eternity, uh, maybe it'll be something that will unite us together and, and uh, uh, be helpful, beneficial. That's true. Okay, uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to pick up next time with uh, a new section called Section 11. And the first question there is, is what about animals? Uh, what will animals inhabit the new earth? And uh, I can see now that we'll be able to get through the next study and finish this topic. We'll even have time. We'll probably get through this half of the study. And then the second half, what I want to do is kind of recap the uh, 50 hours on, on heaven. So you guys, uh, during, between now and next week, if you, if you find a little time, kind of think about some of the things that we've discussed uh, uh, throughout the last basically six months of studying heaven uh, and, and anything you think that uh, you want to bring up as, as really significant in our final closing hour on this topic. Uh, now as we've done in every episode, uh, let's end this by telling people uh, what they need to know so that they, they get to go to heaven because it would be a really a, a horrible shame. How sad would it be if we got someone really excited about going to heaven right now, and oh, they're just, oh, wow, this is wonderful, but they, they didn't know the right way to get there, the only way to get there. Wouldn't that be horrible? So let me ask uh, Brother Mitch, sure. if, if, if I was watching this show now and I said, I want to go to heaven, Mitch, what do I have to do? Please, Please. Tell, tell them. You know, it's it's all about a personal relationship with God, and you get that through 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 of course Jesus Christ who died on the cross. But it, it, it's it's not that if you really want to go to heaven, all you have to do is ask. It's like, well, well, where do I find them? Do I get them on the phone? I mean, where where do I find them? Just ask. He knows. Ask, seek, and knock. And 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 when you when you come to him, he already knows you're going to come to him. He already has you in mind. You're a VIP to him, walking into the kingdom. So, so what I would say is, is if in your heart you want him, you have to realize that Jesus' love for you died on the cross. All of your sins away, anything that would make you unlovely to God has been taken away in love and given to you. And all you need to do is ask and you will receive it. And when you receive it, you'll open up your mouth and you'll know the love of God. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, let's expound on a couple of points he made there. Uh, uh, it's as easy as asking or some people say as believing if, in, in Jesus. Uh, first of all, let's emphasize that, uh, that uh, salvation is exclusively through Jesus Christ. Uh, Muhammad can't save anybody. Buddha can't save anybody. Uh, the Virgin Mary can't save anybody. The Pope can't save anybody. And no person in the world can save themselves through personal merit by trying to please God and be say, God, I'm going to be really good uh, so I can deserve heaven. None of those things can save you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes at the Father except through me. So that's the first thing we want you to understand is the exclusivity of Jesus. He is the only way to receive this eternal life in heaven. And as Brother Mitch says, you come to Jesus and ask him, or you believe in him. You say, I want eternal life in heaven. I believe you're the only way to get it. Will you give it to me? I'm trusting you for it. Now, what is this thing about the the cross, Brother Eric, that he, he mentioned about the cross? What's the significance of that? Well, you know, we talked about that a little bit today. You know, we're born into this world with this this taint, this thing called sin, and 
it's about accepting the fact that there's nothing you personally can do to be rid of it. It's on you, it's in you, it's part of you. And as a result, it cuts you off from God. But God wants there to be a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to be cut off from him. He wants to have that, that personal relationship Mitch talked about with you. So a price had to be paid for sin. And God told us that it was through the shedding of blood that the sacrifice had to be made. And this was all the symbolic sacrifice all through the Old Testament that you may have heard about in the stories of the Old Testament, the, the sacrifices of the animals. These were paving the way for what was truly going to happen, which was the picture of the Savior who would one day come to make the sacrifice, the one and only sacrifice, that actually would be the substitute that needed to be made for our, on our behalf. And when Jesus came, his suffering and dying, his shedding of the blood on that cross was to pay that amount, that price that you could never possibly hope to ever meet. You could never pay this cost. You could never pay this price because you yourself tainted with sin are not worthy to pay such a price. Jesus came and died on that cross to pay that price in full for you. And once he did that, you were saved. It wasn't that you were being saved. You were saved. It happened, and when you trust and you put what Christ did on your balance, when you pay that balance off by trusting that what he did covers that whole thing, you trust in it completely for that. The balance is wiped away. That, that, that merit that you can't possibly meet is paid for by Christ's blood and what he shed on the cross. And when that happens, you're saved. That can never be taken away from you. It can never be stripped away from you. Nobody can take it away from you. You can't even give it up yourself. It's a finished act. And this is where Christ confirms this by saying it is finished. All the sacrifice that ever came, all, all the sacrifice that was talked about was met in that one instance where he did this for the whole world. And anyone trusting in this sacrifice and what he did is saved based on it because it covers them. And it can't be stripped from you. It can't be taken from you. And he verified this and showed he was who he said he was and did what he said he was going to do by rising from the dead on the third day, by resurrecting and telling us that one day we would be resurrected just as he was and receive the body just like his was, his was when he returned. And that's what we've been talking about here today in heaven. Okay, so what I'm getting is that the... Uh, him dying in the cross served as a total payment for all of our sins. So now uh, we don't have a sin debt to worry about because Jesus paid for it. And now he, he's offering everybody eternal life just to come to him and ask for it, believe in him, and he gives it to you. And the reason we can believe this is because he raised himself from the dead. That's the sign that, that shows us that he does have power over life and death. Uh, let me ask Brother Austin if there's anything he, he wants to add to this. Yes, please. I'd just like to finish up with uh, John 3.16. Uh, Jesus Christ quoted this. This is his own words. And he said, uh, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. So the question is, uh, you, do you want to perish, or do you want to have an everlasting life? If you believe in Jesus, he gives you everlasting life, and you're not going to perish. Um, I had, uh, uh, you know, almost every day I meet new people on YouTube, and today someone started watching my videos and making comments, and, and he asked me about if I was a member of a, any denomination. And I, I told him, I said, no, I'm, I'm not a member of a denomination. I would classify, my, classify myself as a Christian. Uh, and I went on to say, a Christian is any person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation. I'm not trying to get to heaven through my own merit, through my own effort. I've given up on that and said, uh, it's hopeless. I'm going to depend on Christ to do it for me. And when you rely on him completely, that's when he gives you the eternal life. Okay, so if everybody, uh, anybody who's watching this uh, now, uh, if you understand this and you believe in Jesus for your salvation, then he gave you eternal life at the moment you believed. And I hope that you will make a comment on this video so that, so that we on the panel uh, learn about this and we want to celebrate. So uh, thank you for watching, and panelists, thank you for participating.
Uh, next Sunday will be the final episode, episode 25, on the topic of heaven. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.